Exodus 14. That's where we're going to start. And there'll be a few others. Like I said, they'll be on the screen for you. Exodus 14. Let's begin reading with verse 30. So the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. When Israel saw the great power which the Lord had used against the Egyptians, the people, Israel, feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant, Moses. Lord, we just pray. We know that it is through the ministry of Holy Spirit that our hearts are able to be receptive to your word, that it's more than just knowledge in our head. Lord, it becomes that that we're able to know personally and live out. And we pray that through the ministry of Holy Spirit that you would quicken our hearts to receive your word, that it may be profitable toward the working of your will in and through our lives for the advancement of your kingdom. Lord, we ask these things in the mighty name of Christ, our Lord and Savior, and everyone say it. Amen. Now, can you imagine? I read this story many times. I can remember it as a little kid. I know I've alluded to the whole felt board. I love the felt board. I love playing with the little figures on the felt board. You ever did that? I love that. But we've all sat in Sunday school, or maybe we've even taught, and we've heard messages about God's miracle at the Red Sea. But could you imagine standing on the banks of the Red Sea on that day that this scripture reference alludes to? And we've just walked across on a dry seabed. To the other side. And the water that once occupied the space of our pathway became a standing wall to our right and to our left. And we walked across in amazement at this miracle of nature, and now the enemy that once pursued us with vicious ill intent lay at our feet. It just says the seashore. So I'm sure some of the bodies washed up on their side that they crossed to. Now the enemy's laying there vanquished by the Lord. And how else could we respond to the Lord's gracious hand than with reverent fear that leads to believing in him? And that's what Moses tells us. That the people of Israel, when they saw God's hand move in this gracious way, that they stood in awe in reverent fear, and it led to them believing in him. Now we know as we read Exodus, and really the, well, Exodus, the, the whole journey, and we can read in Numbers that throughout Israel's journey through the wilderness... And we understand why it was called a wilderness. It wasn't like we would think of with foliage and and trees and oases and things of that nature. No, it was called a wilderness because it was what? Barren. That's why it was a wilderness. Just sand. There was nothing there. And throughout their journey through this wilderness, the wilderness of Sinai, God led his people through difficult and trying situations. We don't always know, as we've heard stated before, and maybe you have even said, why God allows problems. But we know he intends us to walk through them, and that in his hands these problems or able to heighten our maturity as his children and deepen our faith. In fact, one minister put it this way. He says, trials and troubles are dumbbells and treadmills for our soul. So it's like lifting spiritual weights and doing spiritual calisthenics. 
It builds our endurance and our spiritual muscles so that we're not flabby believers, weak in our faith. Difficult and trying situations in our walk with the Lord develops strength spiritually and develops spiritual stamina. And the last verse of Exodus 14, verse 31, that we've read tells us in a very direct way that Israel's narrow escape, because it was a narrow escape. I preached from this passage uh, a few years back, and I used the illustration, just a picture to show you. So in your mind, because I don't have that ability to do that tonight because the life has down, but just think in your mind a seashore... And the only way they got to that shore was through a narrow opening through a mountainous region. So they walked through the narrow mountainous region and they're camping at the seashore. And they've got the sea in front of them, this narrow opening behind them, and here comes Pharaoh's army. They don't have anywhere to go. They're trapped. And that's where they were. And the last verse of Exodus 14 tells us in a very direct way that Israel's narrow escape, if you will, because we understand their physical circumstances, it benefited their faith. God had a purpose in it. In fact, we've read that through this experience of the Red Sea parting and of them walking on the dry seabed and getting to the other side and then seeing God vanquish their enemies before their very eyes and seeing their bodies wash up on the shore, the verse tells us that out of that they feared the Lord and they believed in the Lord and his servant Moses. It strengthened their belief and their trust in God. And what this tells us is that faith has a cumulative quality. Faith has a cumulative quality. In other words, through each difficult and trying situation, our faith is grown and is laid up in store for future times ahead of us. Our faith grows stronger through the seasons of life as we walk through them. And like the words of the song that that Kip did tonight, Louise Stead, she wrote those words and William Kirkpatrick, he put those words to music. But as we sing tonight, the chorus to it, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him. How I've proved him or and or. Over and over and over and over again, through the trials, through the difficulties, it has proved to me that God is faithful. And I can put my trust in him. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. And then she writes in there, oh, for God's grace, that I might trust him even more. And as we consider through Exodus 14, just the definition of faith, I want us to consider through a few verses in the New Testament from God's word in regards to faith. What is faith? What is faith? What is trusting and and holding to the Lord? You know, from Mary's story, we are told in Luke 1, 45, she's with child. And she trusts and she believes in the Lord. And it tells us Elizabeth, her cousin, even speaks over her and says, Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what God had spoken to her by the Lord. Mary trusted. Mary believed. She's blessed because she believed that there would be a fulfillment to what God had spoken. How about Romans 4, 20 and 21? Here Paul talks about Abraham, very familiar verses of Scripture and talking about what faith is. Yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but he grew stronger in faith, giving glory to God and being fully assured that what God had promised, he was able to what? Perform. So Romans 4 and verse 21 tells us that faith is being assured that God is able to do what he's promised. How about Acts 27 verses 23 through 25? 
Paul relates in this story in his life that the angel of the Lord came and spoke to him because they're pretty much stranded in the sea on this ship that is battered by the storms. And they're fearing for their lives. And Paul tells the crew, For this very night an angel of God to whom I belong, whom I also serve, came to me saying, Do not be afraid. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has graciously granted you all those who sail with you. Therefore, Paul says, keep up your courage, men, for I believe, God, that it will turn out exactly as I have been told. What is faith? I believe that it will come out exactly the way God said that it would. And then in Hebrews 11.11, it speaks of Sarah's story. Abraham, Sarah, and by faith, even Sarah herself received ability to conceive even beyond the proper time of life since she considered God, him faithful, who had promised. So through all of these scriptures, what what is faith? What is faith? I, I like the way that Pastor Robert Morgan defined faith, even from these scriptures, that we can relate the way he defined faith in the scriptures we've just read. And that is, faith is making reasonable assumptions. Reasonable assumptions. Didn't Mary make a reasonable assumption? She believed that there would be a fulfillment in what God had spoken. How about Abraham? He was fully assured that what God had promised, he was able to bring about. What about Paul? He says, men, take courage, for I believe God and what he has said, and I believe everything will turn out exactly in the way he has told me. And what about Sarah? She considered God faithful who had promised. So faith is making a reasonable assumption. It's about making a reasonable assumption regarding who God is and what he has promised. Who he is and what he's promised. And isn't that what each of these verses, even I've alluded to several times from the lives of Mary, Abraham, Paul, and Sarah, tell us? And do they not speak of how each of these individuals made reasonable assumptions about God's care, about God's control over their lives that was based upon his promise, the word that he had spoken. We're not going to understand, as we've alluded to many times before, why we walk through some of the things we've walked through. We're not going to understand every circumstance. And at certain times, it may be extremely difficult for us in the moment to appreciate every event. And it can be especially difficult when we are backed up to the Red Sea with the army of Pharaoh in hot pursuit. Yet it is vitally important to our spiritual life, to our walk with the Lord, that we hold to the Lord at the times of those especially difficult moments. Because it's exactly the way that Romans 8, 28 speaks. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good. To those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Philippians 1, 6, Paul says this as he's sitting under house arrest. Yes, he's in prison. We alluded to the scripture a few weeks back. Paul says, I'm confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work among you will complete it by the day of Christ. Faith is making a reasonable assumption in that God is working a good work in us. A good work. It may not seem good at the time, but if we do as Mary... I'm believing that the things he has promised is going to come about. If we're like Abraham, he is faithful. Paul, 
Sarah, these individuals, we know God is working a good work in us, and we've alluded to Romans 8, 28, and I just want to remind you about that. I understand the election's over. It's over. Anybody have any anxiety about the results yesterday? Anybody? Anybody pose any what-ifs yesterday or through the weeks or months? Just what ifs. You know, regardless who would have been in the White House on January 20th of next year, God hasn't changed, has he? He's still the same. And you know, the same thing that that possibly pressed us as believers across this nation to pray and intercede should be the same thing that presses us to pray and intercede regardless if the candidate we wanted is in the White House or not. We don't let our foot off the gas just simply because the one who we wanted to be in for four years is there. That somehow we don't have to live by faith anymore because maybe in these next four years, you know, things will kind of be easy. But I'm here to tell you, it's not going to be. It's not going to be. We must still live by faith. The Bible says it is impossible to please God unless we live by what? And what is faith? Faith is making a reasonable assumption in who God is and that he will act because of who he is in the way that he has promised. It doesn't always mean we get what we want. And I love what Dr. Mike Rates stated. He had a, she was 28, his daughter, uh, leukemia. And they were praying and they were believing God to heal. Never wavered, declaring that. But she passed. The Lord took her home. And Pastor Rake says, you know what? You don't necessarily need faith when everything's going good. You need faith when everything's not going good. You know, there's some truth to that, isn't there? It doesn't mean that faith isn't there while things are going well, but faith is really noticeable, isn't it? Faith is really exposed when things aren't going well. When things aren't going the way we want them to go or to our liking, when the trials and the tests come, and the way that we direct our minds and our thoughts and our hearts in making a reasonable assumption in who God is, And that he will be faithful to his word. May we not forget that we serve a God who grows things. God grows things. He's a God that has come to give life and life to the full, right? The way that he created it in the very beginning with Adam and Eve in Genesis. He is a God who grows things. And faith, may we never forget, is a growing entity. It's not to just stay the same. It's to grow. It's to flourish. It's to mature. And God intends to develop us spiritually. How does God develop us spiritually? I'm not saying you don't know these things. You know these things, but it's nice to be reminded, isn't it, every now and then? To be reassured. How does God develop us spiritually? Well, it's like any good teacher. The Lord brings his truth to our lives just like he did for Israel and Egypt and at the Red Sea. And then after receiving that truth, he brings tests. Now, how many of you like tests? I had some fellow students that liked tests. You know what I called them? Weird. I hated tests. <laughs> I, I mean, I, hate, I get anxiety. I'm going to forget something. I can be a bad test taker because of that. But I don't, I don't necessarily enjoy tests. But how does God develop us spiritually? He teaches us his truth. And then after receiving the truth, he brings tests in order to review and to reinforce that truth that he's taught us, right? And why does he do that? Because he likes to toy with us? 
You know, I thought that about some of my teachers. They hate me. And they didn't. I'm saying, I know we got some teachers in there. They, did, they didn't hate me. It was just my issues, right? My issues. But the tests were for my good, to teach me the truth and to reinforce that truth in me. God does the same thing. Why does he do it? He brings the test to reinforce that truth for the purpose of trans referring and translating that truth into a lasting, life-changing experience. It's not just something that is in our head. It's in our hearts. It's in our being. It's what we flesh out, what we live out, and we learn, just like the children of Israel standing there. My goodness. God just parted those waters. He just caused the seabed to be dry. And we get to the other side, and here comes Pharaoh, and then what does God do? He closes it all up, and now our enemies are at our feet, and my mind goes back to the ten plagues and everything that he did to get us out of Egypt. My goodness, this God that I serve. Romans 5, 3 through 5, I've used this a few weeks back, but it is so true. We also celebrate in our tribulations. That seems so countercultural, doesn't it? How can I celebrate unless everything's going well? I can't celebrate in tribulation. Not from a natural standpoint, but God says we are able also, Paul states here in Romans 5, because of our relationship with God, we are able to celebrate in our tribulations. Why? Because we know that tribulations bring about perseverance, spiritual strength, spiritual stamina. And that perseverance brings about proven character that we are being formed in the image of Christ. And then that proven character brings about the result of our hope that anchors our soul. And then he says in verse 5, and that hope does not disappoint. Was the children of Israel disappointed on that day? They weren't disappointed. And if they would have listened to God and learned the lessons, that first generation, if they would have listened and if they would have learned to trust in the Lord step by step by step by step as he led them through the wilderness because he was doing a work in them so that they would be prepared to take the promised land and trust in him completely, they wouldn't have died in what made them miserable because they didn't get to the place of understanding that God gives us his truth, but then he's going to bring testing to reinforce that truth so that it will bring about life transformation within us. Hope does not disappoint because the love of God. Again, what kind of work is it that God's doing in us? It's a good work. It's, how many times have you had to remind yourself, and I've had to remind myself, this is a good work. And I'm not saying that everything that comes into our life is from the hand of God. Some of it is because we live in a fallen world among fallen people of who we used to be a part of. And we have an enemy of our soul that wants to steal from us. He wants to kill and destroy us. Sometimes it's just because of that, but then sometimes God is at work. But it doesn't matter whether it's God at work in reinforcing that truth through times of testing or whether it's we live in a sinful world or because the enemy is attacking us. Romans 8, 28 tells us that God's able to use all those things for our good. We continue to put our lives in his hands and we do what Psalm 16, what David says, we continuously set the Lord before us. That is so vitally important. Every single day, I'm reminding myself through my prayer, through my reading of scripture, through my devotion to him, that's not just so that I can soothe my conscience and shake it off my spiritual to-do list. It is about actively setting God before me, reminding myself that my life is in his hands. And whether it comes, those times of testing come from him, or it's because I live in a sinful world or because the enemy is attacking me. If my life is in his hands, then God is able to mold it and use it for our good. Why? Because I make a calculated assumption. 
God is who he says he is, and he will do what he says he will do if I hold to him. We come to Exodus 19, and I'm going to close with this illustration. But as we come to Exodus 19, we find Israel. They have made their way to where God told Moses he would bring them. It's the fulfillment of the promise. God appeared to Moses in the wilderness, right? Mount Sinai. He said, this will be proof that I've spoken to you. To go and to deliver my people, I will bring you back to this place. Exodus 19 is the fulfillment of that. That promise in Exodus 3. And it's here as they come to the mountain. And you can read it. God calls Moses from the mountain and tells Moses, this is what he is to say to the children of Israel. Verse 4. You yourselves, talking to the children of Israel, have seen what I did to the Egyptians. They physically saw it. And how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Even Moses alluded to this in what we call Moses' song at the end of his life when Joshua is given leadership. God is going to take Moses off because of his disobedience in striking the rock instead of speaking to it. And in his song and just worshiping the Lord, Deuteronomy 32, verses 10, 11, and 12, Moses uses this illustration that God presents in Exodus 19 about him carrying the nation of Israel as an eagle on his wings. And it says that God found him, talking about Israel, in a desert land and in the howling wasteland of a wilderness. He encircled him. He cared for him, talking about Israel. He, he guarded them as the apple of his eye. And as an eagle stirs up its nest and hovers over its young, he spread his wings, he caught them, he carried them on his pinions. The Lord alone guided them. It fits right into the fact of God teaches this truth, but then he brings times of testing to reinforce that, that it turns into a life-transforming experience. And really, this illustration of an eagle speaks to the maturing of our faith through times of testing. Because if we've ever done any studying, just real quickly, on an eagle, at a certain stage in the development of, of their young, the parent eagles break up the comfortable nest. How many of you like your comfort? I'll, I'll raise my hand. I like my comfort. I like my comfort. But the eagle comes in and, and breaks up the comfortable nest and forces the eaglets to fly. I don't want to. Have you ever said that, like me, Lord, I really don't want to do that. I really don't want to go there. I really, I really like where I am right now. I don't want to step out there. But the parent eagle forces the eaglets out of the nest to fly. And the adult eagle stays near the, the fledglings, and if they fall... The parents carry them on their strong wings until the young eaglets learn how to use their wings to ride the air currents and enjoy the abilities that God had given them. And, and God uses that illustration, I carried you. I carried you. Yes, I forced you out, but it was a purpose. It was to grow your faith. It was so that you could make an assumption of who, an accurate assumption of who I am and that I keep my word so that you will be prepared to enter into what I've given and promised you so that you could be the nation. What was Israel separated for? To be a witness of who God was to the other nations, his holiness and his character. Jesus even taught the disciples on the mountainside. Remember Matthew 14? He taught the disciples on the mountainside through the feeding of the 5,000. And then he loaded them into a boat and he sent them to the other side, right? Y'all know the story. And they get to the furthest distance from where they came. 
to where they were going. And that was in the center <laughs> of the lake. They couldn't be any further from either shore, could they? Right in the center. You, you read the scripture. They're right there. They're scared. But Jesus sent them out there in the boat into a storm that was designed to help them apply the truth that he had showed them through the feeding of the 5,000. And Peter got it, didn't he? The other 11, not so much. Peter was willing to step out of the comfort of the ship. And he did well to begin with. And a lot of times we can. We can do well. We can be like Peter. We can step out on the certainty of who God is and what he has promised when he said, Peter, come. But then we can. I've done it. We've all done it, haven't we? We can let life circumstances and all begin to take our focus off of who God is and what he has spoken. But thank God he is always there to do what? That when we cry out to him, he is faithful, even as that parent eagle to come and grab us up. The same is true for us. The Lord sends times of testing into our lives to give us an opportunity to put his teaching into practice. And as we trust him and pass the test, we're strengthened for the future, for God's next but we can't get to God's next until we pass the test. Like Warren Worsby, I, I use this and I remind myself of this so often where he stated, a faith that cannot be tested is a faith that cannot be what? Trusted. And that's so true. Our faith must be tested. We look at the American church today not wanting to be disparaging, but we love our comfort, don't we? We love our comfort. We love the feel-good message. We love, you know, tell me the blessings, the blessings, the blessings, all these different things, and we can become soft. But God stated he's raising up a remnant, Right? He's spoken here. Not only is he spoken here, I told you, he spoke that at the minister's retreat and other places, he's raising up a remnant. But in order for us to be a part of the remnant, we have to walk through these times of testing. Why? So that our faith can be proven. It can be grown. And it can lead us to God's next continuously because it literally is about storing up for the next. Because haven't you faced trials in the past and you look to the future? God's been faithful in the past and I know he'll be faithful in the future because he hasn't changed. Let him test us to prove us so that he can carry us to his next for his glory and his honor and the advancement of his will.